Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are and what time of the day that you're uh, watching this video. I'm Chaudhry Abdullah Qasid. I am an organizational development and business process consultant, and usually I uh, make videos in which I talk about the economy of the world and the economy of the country and how it's affecting different organizations in the country and how different organizations can actually improve the way that they operate by adapting certain strategies and making some improvements in their policies and procedures. Um, but today, the subject that I'm going to uh, make this video about has nothing to do with uh, business or with uh, organizations or with the economy. Uh, this is a subject uh, that is related to something that is a matter of my personal passion. I want to speak about a particular human being, a gentleman um, who was born in 1840 and who died uh, almost 100 years ago in 1923, but who continues to remain as a source of tremendous amount of inspiration to me personally and to many people who know about him. And whenever I tell his story also to people who don't know about him, to new people, they always find it uh, extremely exciting and inspiring as well. And they always tell me and they always ask me to share more information about him uh, with them. So uh, recently, a few days ago, um, I shared a post on Facebook in which I wrote about an incident that happened in the life of this person uh, exactly 100 years ago in 1920 when this person was almost assassinated and about how he survived and uh, about some other things that were related to that incident. And uh, Alhamdulillah, it was received with a lot of appreciation and a lot of people wanted to know much more about this person. Uh, so that made me want to do this video. And also, um, I've published a lot of articles about this person in the past as well in many newspapers and online publications. And I'm uh, also compiling a book by, in which I have... Uh, collected all these articles that I had published earlier and put it together and I've also collected uh, other information about him that was published in the local newspapers of Furipur from where this person belongs and I've also um, taken information from other online sources and from other sources and I've put all of that together um, and compiled a draft of a book but it's going to take time to publish the book. So um, that's why I thought today, uh, the 18th of April uh, 2020, that I'm going to actually try and make a video about this person and pre basically disseminate the information that I have about this person in an audio-visual medium as well, because this is a kind of publication as well. And I thought it would be nice to uh, put all the information that I have about him out there, maybe not in one video, maybe in um, two, three videos, because it might not be possible actually to um, put all the information about him in a single video. So what I'm going to do is that in this video, I'm going to introduce this person and I'll talk a little bit about why this person deserves to be um, given the recognition that I want to give him. Uh, why this person deserves to be talked about and why his contributions and achievements uh, should be shared with a greater audience. And in the um, following um, videos, what I will do is I will try and give a sequential and chronological narration about the different activities and incidents in that person's life. So um, this is basically what the plan is. And now I would like to begin by giving an introduction of who this person is about whom I want to make this video and say all of the things that I want to say. Well, the person that I want to talk about is Chaudhry Mahzuddin Bishash. Um, he was from Faridpur and he is my great grandfather. But I want to actually make it very clear that I'm not making this video in order to glorify my great grandfather and through that, try and bring some glory onto myself or to any of my family members or relatives. Uh, what I'm wanting to do is basically give recognition to someone who had immense contributions to the evolution of our country and to the history of Bengal. Um, there was a lot of contributions that he had and also he had a lot of achievements. And he was a person um, who actually had an impact in many different aspects of history. But at the same time, he was very publicity averse. And not only was he publicity averse, but also 
he believed in his principles deeply and he went against the flow and as a result of that the a lot of the times he um found himself in situations that were sometimes a bit controversial and um not really he wasn't really in favor uh, in the favorable books of the government of the time which is the british Ga raj government and sometimes also um he found himself in situations where those who were recording and publishing the mainstream history of the time uh they also maybe did not look upon him very favorably uh, because of his opinions differing from theirs and as a result of that he didn't receive the the spotlight uh the limelight that he needed to receive and that is why i think it's time um that his deeds his uh, achievements his accomplishments and his contributions uh should be highlighted in public to a greater audience i am recording this uh, video in english because i think uh, it would be nice for international audiences to know about him as well i definitely want to share this um video with my friends who belong to other countries uh, not only my friends who live in other countries but uh, people who belong to other countries as well uh, who are not uh, who would not understand it if i made this video in bangla so um that's the reason that i'm making this video in english so i want to talk a little bit about who choudhury uh, mazuddin bishash was uh, but before that i also want to talk a um, little bit about how i went about the process of gathering the information about uh, about him well uh, a lot of information about him is naturally available in the newspapers of faridpur also a lot of information is available about him in the various archived land deeds and documents and government records so i've definitely collected a lot of uh, official information from there and there are information published about him in some books and publications you'll also find some things written about him in the wikipedia and also in some other online publications as well um there's mention of him in the banglapedia as well and of course uh he's mentioned in bits and pieces in various uh hist historical records so that's where you get the official information from uh but in addition to that um in order to fill in the dots and the gaps i needed a lot of personal information about his life and that alhamdulillah i was able to get from my grandmother my dadi who um got married into the family in 1924 but uh she her life overlapped uh for about 10 years with my great grandmother begum sharafatun nesa who was the wife of uh, choudhury mazuddin bishash so my dadi was very fascinated um when she heard all the stories that my great grandmother would tell about my great grandfather and about all the adventures that they encountered in life together my dadi um begum saida khatun uh she took an interest about this subject and uh noted down a lot of things and when i was young from the time that i was about 10 years old um when I used to hear a lot of stories and anecdotes uh, about my great grandfather being told in my family and I took a fascination uh, from that age and I started noting things down. And then I started um asking my dadi, my grandmother for more and more information and she started uh, opening up and sharing a lot of information with me and I wrote all of that down. And then of course alhamdulillah I had the good fortune of um having a lot of information uh, given to me by one of my aunts uh, sultana fupu uh, who was almost like a family uh, historian and a custodian of a lot of historical facts so alhamdulillah i was able to get a lot of information from her um because she had compiled a lot of information uh, as a child as a teenager from a lot of people who she met um who had actually uh been alive at the time of my great grandfather so um i got a lot of information from her also i got a lot of information from uh directly two people uh two or three people who met my great grandfather um during the time that he was alive and had the opportunity of spending quite a lot of time with him as well one of those persons was a cousin of my grandfather's his name was uh uh mohammed shamsuddin we used to call him shamsu dada um he had actually be served also in world war 2 in the british army and when he was a kid uh he used to be very fond of my um, great grandfather who was uh, his khalu in relation and uh he actually got to see uh, my great grandfather until uh, his early teens so 
and he also took a lot of interest um, in the historical activities of my great grandfather and he used to spend a lot of time with him and ask him a lot of questions so Shamsu Dada was a great source of information as well and there was another cousin of my father's but much much senior to my father um, uh, his name was um, also uh, interestingly um, Shamsuddin he was uh, Shamsuddin Chaudhary so um, I got a lot of information from him. He lived to be almost 100. He passed away a few years ago. And uh, he had actually gotten to see my great-grandfather, Chaudhry Mohizuddin Bishash, um, until uh, he was reaching his teens. So as a boy, he also uh, got to spend quite a lot of time uh, with my great-grandfather and got to see him in person and got to know a lot of stories from him directly. And that was definitely a great uh, treasure trove of information. And of course, my um, dada, my grandfather, also uh, told a lot of stories about his father and the different um, incidents of his life uh, with my grandmother as well. And my grandmother noted those things down and shared all of that information to me. Another great source of information uh, was actually uh, some of the estate officials who worked uh, for our estate and uh, they've, they've been in the family since the mid-1940s and when they came and joined um, the estate management uh, they came and worked directly under people who had been working in the family for more than 50 60 years at that point in time and those were persons who had spent a good 20 30 years with my great grandfather and they had a plethora of information that naturally they disseminated um, to this next generation of estate managers um, and I got a lot of information directly from these the next the second generation of estate managers so alhamdulillah I had a lot of sources of information and I've written all of these things down and I thought that it would be a good idea to put everything in written publication and also in a form of audiovisual publication and hence I am uh, making these videos um, I, w I mean, there are some more sources of information. I also got to meet uh, the descendants of a few of the estate uh, managers who work directly with my uh, great grandfather. And uh, they live in Calcutta now. And I also had the opportunity of interacting with some of them as well. So basically, there's a lot of information that I was able to gather over the years. And uh, interestingly, there's no end to the information that you continue to get as you continue your research. Um, but uh, naturally, I, I don't want to, I mean, it's, it's a work in progress and there will be more information that will be coming in, which can always be added in later. Um, but I definitely want to share whatever I know at this point in time um, to the greater audience. So um, that's basically a little bit about uh, how I've gathered the information. Um, so there's definitely a lot of written sources, archive documents, deeds, and official uh, documents, historical documents and publications. And of course, there are there is a lot of oral history as well. Oh, yes, I also definitely have to mention another gentleman. Uh, his name is Mr. Modi Zaman. He is uh, in his early 80s now. He is um, a historian. Uh, he's written a lot of books on the history of Faridpur, on the history of a lot of important families of Bengal and how they're related to each other by marriage. Um, he's also composed history of Bangabandhu as well. Um, he was actually the president of the press club of Faridpur and uh, definitely he is well known to uh, our family, to my father and he was actually a close friend of uh, one of my chachas, one of my uncles. And uh, I've spent hours with him and I've also taken down a lot of information uh, from him as well. So um, basically, um, these are the sources of information and um, um, I definitely acknowledge, I want to acknowledge them and I want to thank them in this video uh, before I get started. So uh, who was uh, Chaudhary Mohizuddin Bishash? Uh, why was he uh, someone so great? Why was he someone um, that I look up to so much? Why do I get so much inspiration from him? Why do everyone who listens to him want to know more about him and find him to be so fascinating? So let me answer those questions. Um, 
First and foremost, I want to make sure that you understand that I at no point am making a claim that he was the greatest zamindar or that he owned the maximum amount of land in Bengal or in India or he was the richest or he was the most powerful. I'm not making any of those superlative claims, nor am I saying that uh, his family lineage uh, was actually um, the oldest or the grandest or the loftiest. I'm not making any kinds of claims along those lines. Why? Uh, but what I am saying is that whatever that he was able to achieve, he did so against innumerable adversities. And the extent of his achievements and contributions, given the adversities and the challenges that he faced, was absolutely phenomenal. And that is what uh, uh, makes him so outstanding a person. And that is what makes him someone to uh, definitely be worth talking about. So. Uh, let me tell you a little bit more about him, so then you will also understand why I am so awed by him. And at that point, I want to also add another thing. Uh, this is an informal video. I'm not going to be following any proper chronology. I, I'm, I'm just going to be throwing uh, facts as they come to my mind. And um, therefore, you will find me to be skipping back and forth and sometimes adding points here and there as well. It's just the way that I would be telling you the story if we were sitting uh, right here and uh, you know, discussing about him. So uh, flashes of thoughts will be coming in and I'll be throwing those in and uh, please don't mind about that. So um, yeah, so uh, before losing the train of thought, what I want to say is I'm going to be referring to him as Chaudhary Mohizuddin uh, Bishash uh, by name and I will not be referring to him as my great grandfather because I want to completely disassociate myself from him at this point in time because um, whatever I'm going to say about him, I am going to say about him from a completely neutral external standpoint out of my pure fascination for him as a, as, as, as a human being. I'm, I'm not going to be talking about him as his great grandchild. So uh, who was he? Uh, first, let me give a little bit of introduction of his family. Uh, then you'll be able to maybe relate and connect to him and understand who he was. He was the father of Chaudhary Abdullah Zahiruddin Lal Mia, Chaudhary Yusuf Ali Mohan Mia, and Chaudhary Anayat Hussain Tara Mia. All three of them were very uh, prominent political leaders of uh, East Bengal, East Pakistan, and Bengal as a whole um, in the 1950s and 60s uh, especially. Uh, but uh, particularly Lalmia um, has uh, a great involvement in the anti-colonial movement from uh, 1918 onwards. Uh, so he was very prominent in the anti-colonial movement in the 1920s, 1930s and onwards. And um, uh, Mohan Mia, his younger brother, was also very much, uh, he got into politics from the mid-1930s and he became particularly prominent in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. So. Um, and of course, um, there was Tara Mia. He was more involved at a local uh, level, at a district level in Faridpur, in politics from 1930s, and then also came into national politics in 1960s as well. So um, I'm not going to be mentioning too much about um, them or what portfolios and positions they, uh, they held, uh, because that would be taking me away from the main context that we want to be talking about. But I can say that all three brothers held uh, positions in the parliament uh, at a national level as well as at a state level. And uh, two of the brothers held ministerial positions. Lal Mia was a central cabinet minister. Mohan Mia was a state level minister. Um, so it's, it's, it was actually very uh, rare to find a family where all three brothers, uh, and Taramiya was in the central parliament as well in the 1960s. So it was actually very rare to find a, Bangladesh, a Bengali family uh, to have three uh, brothers at the same time who were so prominent in national level and subcontinental level politics. Um, there are some other people also in politics uh, from the family in the present times as well. Um, there is Chaudhary Kamal Ibn Yusuf. He is um, an uncle of mine, um, eldest son of Mohan Mia. Um, I happen to be the grandson of Lal Mia. My father is Chaudhary Musharraf Hussain, the youngest son of Lal Mia. Um, just to uh, uh, clarify how I'm related to the family. But anyway, as I was saying, getting back to the track, um, so there, there are some more prominent politicians in our uh, family at the moment among the descendants of Chaudhary Moizuddin. So there's uh, Mr. Chaudhary Kamal Ibn Yusuf, as I was saying. He was member of parliament six times. Uh, 
uh, from the late 1970s um, till, uh, till 2009. And within this time, he was a member of parliament six times. And he also had the opportunity of uh, serving as a minister uh, three times in three of those six terms. Um, further on, um, I want to uh, mention that uh, Mr. Uh, Chaudhary Kamal Ibn Yusuf's younger brother, Chaudhary Akmal Ibn Yusuf, was also a member of parliament. And uh, in present time, since 2009, um, another of uh, Chaudhary Mahizuddin Bishash's uh, great grandchildren has been a member of parliament and minister twice, and a member of parliament three times, and that is. Uh, engineer uh, Khandukar Musharraf, and uh, he happens to be the uh, eldest son of one of uh, Chaudhry Mohizuddin's uh, granddaughters from his daughter, through his daughter. So uh, basically there are quite a few uh, members of the family who have been in politics, and uh, I'm just saying that so that you can relate to who Chaudhry Mohizuddin Bishash was um, in terms of relating to him uh, from present day prominent family members. Uh, uh, if I want to talk a little bit about his family background, he was the son of Chaudhary Mokibuddin uh, Bishash, who was the zamindar of Chanpur estate, which is another estate in Faridpur. Um, Chanpur estate was actually just one small fraction of the Jagirdari of Arafat Ali. Arafat Ali was Chaudhary Mukimuddin Bishash's 11th ancestor who uh, was given the Jagirdari of Fatehabad, uh, which later got converted into Faridpur. Uh, in the early 1600s, uh, through Mughal accreditation uh, during the reign of Emperor Jahangir. So um, uh, the, the Jagirdari uh, continued in, uh, to exist across the 1600s and the 1700s until the British uh, Raj took over and annexed uh, East Bengal and Faridpur into the uh, Raj in the 1760s. And in 1790, uh, uh, basically, the, the dominion or this Jagirdari was cut up into 23 pieces and then each fragment was auctioned off uh, to the highest bidder in the 1790s. And basically, a lot of the uh, Hindu zamindaris of Faridpur all over the greater Faridpur arose during that time when um, landlords from other places or business tycoons mostly from West Bengal came in and purchased those different fragments. Uh, but the one of the descendants of Arafat Ali um, didn't really want to have uh, to lose the entire Jagiddari uh, to the British Raj in that way. So basically what he did is he bought back one portion of that vast estate and that was the, uh, uh, that is the estate of Chanpur. And uh, his grandson was actually Chaudhary Mokimuddin. And um, so the person who bought back uh, that estate was uh, Jamaluddin, um, Jamaluddin Bishash. Uh, the reason why the name Bishash got attached to his name was because of the fact that uh, the estate that he bought, the, the, which was a part of his uh, ancestral um, territory that was being governed by his ancestors, that portion was being managed by a family who had Bishash as their title. Um, so when he uh, bought that entire uh, estate, he also assumed the title and affixed it to his name. And hence the, the name Bishash got appended to our family as well. Um, so Jamaluddin Bishash's grandson was Mokimuddin uh, Chaudhary, Mokimuddin Bishash, and his son was Chaudhary Mahizuddin Bishash. So definitely there is an interesting lineage over there of uh, aristocracy and nobility. But um, I want to uh, make it very clear that Chaudhary Mahizuddin Bishash did not inherit anything from uh, Chaudhary Mokimuddin Bishash. Uh, when Chaudhary Mokimuddin Bishash died at the age of 15, uh, Chaudhary Mahizuddin 
fell a victim to a lot of conspiracies and he had to leave and go off to North Bengal at the age of 15 in 1855 and over there he started everything from scratch. So that is one of the major reasons why Chaudhry Mahajuddin Bishash deserves so much of credit because all that he was able to create, the vast empire that he was able to set up was something that he did entirely on his own through the fruits of his hard work. Um, he went into the north of Bengal to the Rongpur area and he started working as a disciple and as a helper under the tutelage of the saint of Jonpur who was based over there at that time, Hazrat Maulana Kerama Thali. And under the tutelage of Hazrat Maulana Kerama Thali, um, Chaudhry Mahajuddin Bishash started uh, mainly uh, working to, as, as, as an assistant of the saint, uh, taking care of his followers and disciples uh, who would go over there to visit and learn from the saint. And side by side, uh, he started capitalizing on his goodwill and started engaging in small business activities in which uh, his reputation and his word were, was the main capital that he was able to bring forward and invest. And um, I'm going to talk about his uh, business prowess and what kind of businesses he did a little bit later. But what I'm going to say is that it was through those businesses that he started gaining the money with which he started buying property and land. And uh, in time, during his lifetime, starting from the, the, that point in time in about uh, 1857, till he died in 1923, in this 66 years of time frame, he was able to create uh, a veritable empire which comprised of uh, the estates of about 83 other zamindars. He annexed, he acquired their estates to form his massive mega estate, uh, which actually was one of the 100 largest estates uh, all over India. And it was definitely one of the, um, among the top 10 largest estates within Bengal. Um, I need to explain a couple of things over here. Um, within Bengal, the largest estate was held by the Bardwan Raj, uh, and then of course there were several other estates in Bengal, um, all of whom owned uh, land between five to seven million acres, uh, which is um, massive land uh, in, in the in the zone of uh, over ten thousand square kilometers. Um, the Rajshahi Raj was also a massive, uh, I mean, the, basically the Nato Raj, the Rajshahi Raj. They also had an estate of uh, more than 12,000 square kilometers, which was about 4 million uh, acres. Um, we had several large uh, such estates within East Bengal. Uh, there was uh, the estate of Hasan Raja, uh, who owned about half a million acres. And there was also the estate of um, Bhawal Raja, and also the Dhaka Nawab estate. And there were several of these massive estates. And Chaudhry Mahajuddin Bishash's estate was one of them. Uh, he owned about a million acres of land, 4,000 square kilometers, which if you were to put all of it together, would be about half of the greater district of Faridpur um, and about double the size of the present district of Faridpur. Uh, his land uh, was not all in one block and that is why sometimes it was not easy to understand the enormity of the estate because it was scattered in fragments uh, all over. Um, a big chunk of the land was definitely held within what is Faridpur today, but there was also vast portions of the estate scattered in uh, Gualondo, which uh, is now Rajbari district in Shoryutpur, in Madaripur, and also in Kushtia, in Manikganj, in Pabna, in Narenganj, in Tangail, Maiman Singh, and Rongpur. That's within East Bengal. And then he also owned land in West Bengal, in Chobish Porgona Jela, which is 24 Porgonas, and in and around Calcutta, in Darjeeling, and in other parts of India as well, such as um, uh, in Jaunpur, and he also owned land in uh, the city of Makkah uh, in Saudi Arabia, um, which he had purchased in 1909, uh, 1910, um, when Saudi Arabia was under Ottoman rule. So uh, basically, um, this is a snapshot of the, uh, the extent of the, and the vastness of the estate that was created by Chaudhry Mahajuddin Bishash uh, through entrepreneurial earnings and uh, in a time when the society was so stratified and 
uh, people could not really grow so much because um, there was a very rigid class system and social mobility was not encouraged and people created a lot of obstructions to one another so that people would not be able to grow. So even within that kind of a stratified society, the fact that he was able to grow to this extent is truly phenomenal. The kind of businesses that um, he was able to do were far ahead of his time. And that deserves a lot of uh, credit and accolades. I also want to throw in a few other quick um, points, uh, a little bit more about the estate. Um, basically, um, about 20 to 30 of the largest estates uh, within Bengal uh, owned approximately uh, uh, 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent of the land surface area of uh, the whole of Bengal. Um, the Merzuddin estate, uh, in terms of land surface area, uh, would be about 1.67 percent of the whole of Bengal and about 2.7 percent of East Bengal, what is Bangladesh today. The rest of uh, the land surface area of about two-thirds of it, about 65%, was actually owned by more than uh, another 1,000 uh, estate holders. And those estates were smaller estates, much smaller estates, which ranged in size from a few thousand acres to maybe 10 to 15,000, 20,000 acres range. Um, so uh, that's basically the, the status. Uh, why I mentioned that um, Chodri, not only Chaudhary Mahajuddin's estate, but uh, all the other top 10, the 10, 15, 20 estates uh, that were like really large in Bengal could have easily been included as uh, princely states among the 526 princely states. Um, but they were not included in the princely states because they were located in Bengal. Bengal was one of the provinces uh, which was directly controlled by the British administration. It was called a presidency. There were 16 provinces which were directly managed by the British government. And the rest of India were, um, had 526 uh, estates that were uh, deemed as principalities. And there were kings who were managing those, as, uh, those estates. So had Chaudhry Mahajuddin Bishash and uh, the Dhaka Nawab estate and then the Bardwan estate and all of these estates not fallen into a presidency, then they would definitely be ranked as a princely state as well because the princely states varied largely in size. The smallest of the princely states was about 66 square kilometers um, in area, uh, which is relatively uh, small, about uh, 13, 14,000 acres only. Uh, to, to the largest one being the estate of Hyderabad, uh, which actually was uh, the size of Scotland, uh, meaning a little bit larger than uh, or approximately the size of Bangladesh. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, basically, definitely uh, Chaudhry Mahajuddin's estate and many of the other biggest estates in Bengal could easily have been independent, uh, I mean, uh, not sovereign, but autonomous principalities as well. And because of their size, though they were within the presidency of uh, Bengal, they were given uh, to a great extent the honor and the respect and the status that was very similar to that of a principality. Um, <clears throat> I would um, like to also mention that uh, the title of, uh, which is why the title of um, Nawab and then Raja Bahadur, Maharaja, these titles were given to many of these large uh, estates uh, within Bengal. Um, the estate of Chaudhary Mahizuddin Bishash, the Chaudhary Mahizuddin estate, was also um, offered the status of a Nawabi, and uh, he had been offered the title of a Nawab in the 1880s. But because of the fact that um, he was not very cooperative with the British government and he uh, was consistently actually maintaining a very uh, diplomatic resistance and opposition with them. Uh, that is why he did not accept the title and he refused it. And um, later after he died, uh, some certain members of the British government wanted to embarrass uh, Chaudhry Mahizuddin's memory and therefore posthumously issued a declaration that he is going to be uh, proclaimed as a Khan Sahib, which is a far more junior title than that of the title of Nawab, uh, which had been offered to him. But uh, basically, um, when this title of Khan Sahib was uh, declared, then uh, his son, uh, the son of Chaudhry Mahizuddin, Lalmiya uh, mainly, uh, 
officially rejected the title and uh, didn't have it affixed to his father's name posthumously. So um, that's basically who Chaudhry Mohsuddin was in terms of uh, the estate um, that he managed, that he governed. Um, there were almost uh, one, and, uh, according to the census of 1906, the the estates that he owned and governed had almost 1.6 million people residing in it at that time. So, and he was almost like a father figure to all of them. I want to mention another thing over here that um, Chaudhry Mahesuddin Bishash, uh, when he governed his territories, he didn't actually maintain a relationship like a master and serf or like a, a, a rent collecting lord and uh, a rent providing uh, tenant. Uh, what he did is he formed partnerships with all the farmers. So he was like um, a senior partner who was providing the land, the capital and the technology as well for the farming and the farmers were actually doing the farming on the ground. And that way um, he was able to actually generate a lot more uh, produce from the land that he owned and he was actually also able to um, create like a cooperative society and instead of having like a block of land chopped up into small pieces each piece assigned to a different farmer what he did is he didn't divide the land he had the the benefits and the revenue coming from the land being divided among the farmers so what he did is he had those lands uh, put together into one into large blocks so he would have like large blocks of land for 10 kilometers 15 kilometers having the same kind of uh, crop being farmed on it and therefore he was able to generate enormous amount of economies of scale which other lords were not able to because they didn't really get into the details of managing the estate so in that way um, by capitalizing on economies of scale and he directly was investing on research and development on technology and fertilizers he was able to generate a much higher yield and he was able to generate a much bigger earning for the farmers and himself and he was also able to give the taxes to the government on time and keep them satisfied and as long as he was being able to pay the taxes to the government he started to promulgate the notion that as long as i'm giving you the taxes i can actually um, have a voice and a say about how things should be done and um, he started encouraging more and more of the aristocrat community to adopt that sort of an attitude that as long as you're paying your taxes you can have a say in how things should happen and that's how gradually um, he started he had a very big influence in the creation of constitutional politics in the entire subcontinent in in the early 1880s um, in the district of Faridpur, uh, an association was uh, formed called the people's association of Faridpur, and uh, Chaudhry Mahesuddin Bishesh was one of the promoters of this organization and one of the founder patrons um, this is practically the very first political party of what is Bangladesh today and uh, this was created uh, with purely the agenda of creating a, a, a scenario where the British government would gradually have to become accountable to the people of the country. And he uh, played a big role in the formation of the District Council of Faridpur and set off the chain reaction for the formation of district councils in other districts of uh, the country as well. And through the formation of the District Council where he brought in other uh, lords and aristocrats and merchants and important people, uh, lawyers, barristers, and he, he created the district council in a way that uh, basically the government, uh, the British government, would have to discuss with this council about how they want to utilize the revenue and what kind of development initiatives they will take within the district. And that is how he paved the way for constitutional politics to arise where the people of Bengal would start to have a participative role in the management of Bengal. Um, uh, because of these initiatives of his, um, the, the people who were at that point in time um, working towards the creation of the All Indian Congress also got in touch with him. Um, Chaudhry Mahesuddin Bishash's very close friend and legal advisor was Ombika Choron Modumdar, uh, 
who was involved with the founding of Congress as well. And basically through to Ombika Charan Mojumdar, Chaudhry uh, Mohsuddin Bishesh became involved with the process of the founding of Congress. And he also became one of the founder patrons and promoters of Congress in 1885. Um, and he continued to remain a big supporter of the All Indian and later the Bengal Congress. And in the early 1900s, uh, when uh, the Bongo Bongo took place, the, which is the partitioning of Bengal, Bengal was divided and East Bengal was created and West Bengal was separated and Dhaka became the capital. Um, the Congress party uh, vehemently opposed it and they were uh, repeatedly um, working to uh, towards and lobbying for the reunification of Bengal. And uh, Chaudhry Mohsuddin Bishash was a very prominent promoter of the concept of reunification. Um, he was also present in um, the, ninth, uh, in the, the, the conference uh, in Shahbag in 1905 December or 1906 December, which actually paved the creation of Muslim League and the Bongo Bongo. Um, he was there and he also gave a speech, but uh, he did not get involved into Muslim League because uh, he didn't quite agree with the idea of forming a party uh, with on the basis of religion. And he was also definitely uh, not in agreement with uh, the concept with which uh, Muslim League was 